What's up, everyone, and welcome back to Star Wars Explained. Today, I am so excited to have the author of the new book, Star Wars Brotherhood, with us. Welcome, Mike Chin. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. Sure. I was really excited to have you. I uh, immediately after finishing the book uh, emailed to see if I could get an, er in an interview with you because uh, I had a blast reading it. It's so much fun. Uh, so I'm just so psyched to talk with you about it. Well, thank you so much for oh, for, yeah. for reading it and enjoying it. It's <laughs> as someone who has loved Star Wars my whole life, it's very nerve wracking to to you know hear people starting to talk about it um, because you don't want to mess up this thing that you love. It's very different from my original books, which is just like if, if no one likes it, it just kind of disappears into the ether. If I screw this one up, everyone knows about it. <laughs> I, I think that your love and your passion certainly come through. Uh, I, I want to talk about that. One of my first questions is about exactly that, but uh, I'd like to start my interviews uh, with a little icebreaker question. Uh, I would like to know who is your favorite like C or D list Star Wars character, someone who you think that maybe you have a shot at being like their biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, uh... When before I actually qualified as a Star Wars writer, um, when we were doing when from a certain point of view, before I did that, um, I tried to like audition for it on Twitter by writing um, like pitches for from a certain point of view, the Phantom Menace. And one of the ideas in there was CO Bibble. I don't even know if I'm saying his name right because no one ever says his name. But CO Bibble was the, like a, the backstory about like why he thinks that a communications breakdown leads to invasion because that's quite the leap. So I've always been, I've always found that character to be a little bit fascinating because he's just he's strictly there for a line of exposition from George Lucas. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'd probably go with him. I actually saw the actor in a production of uh, Coriolanus, which is a lesser known Shakespeare play. This was summer in 2000. So like right after Th The Phantom Menace came out and I didn't even know he was in it. I was in London at the time and I went to go see Ray Fiennes and Ian McDiarmid in it. And then I'm like, oh, it's it's that dude who <laughs> talks about communications breakdowns. <laughs> so <laughs> I would um, I would be happy to write a short story about him. That that sounds like the perfect pitch, honestly, because you're right. Like, what happened to him in the past to make him think that like there's only one option? It's not that uh, oh, the technology just went down. Yeah, like, no, nope. it's not. <laughs> not that that cell phone hanger or the, the cell phone towers went down. It is there is an invasion because you can't get signal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a great answer. That's one I've never heard before, and I assume you're saying his name right. I don't know how else you would. Say yeah, it, no so. one ever says his name, so <laughs> we don't Co, know. Co Bibble, I love that. Well, that that uh, tracks with kind of what you said uh, in the acknowledgments for Brotherhood. You said that it's always been kind of your pie in the sky dream to write not only a Star Wars story but a prequel era Star Wars story. So mm -hmm. I'd love to know what is it about this era of the universe that called out to you as a writer. Um, it's weird because like I grew up with the original trilogy and my, my big thing growing up, I mean, yeah, I loved Luke. I loved, you know, lightsabers. I found the force fascinating, all that stuff. But my favorite thing about the original trilogy was X-Wings. Like I drew X-Wings. I built X-Wings out of my Legos, like X-Wing for DOS when that came out in 95 or 93 or whenever, like that was like a dream come true for me. So it's kind of weird that it's kind of weird that, uh, I became so fascinated with the prequel era. I think it's probably the world building of, of the era because there's so much going on. And it's, it's, if you look at the other eras in Star Wars, they're kind of static, like in, in terms of like the, the situation has been established. And so you have the rebels who are like trying to dismantle the situation, but it's like, it's pretty clear the empire's in charge. Um, in like the sequel era, it's like, you know, it's 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 like the first order is rising, but the the new republic has been there for a while. Um, but then with the prequel era, there is like active decay going on across three movies, and I think with that, when you uncover each layer of it, it's like it's corruption, it's institutions not living up to their ideals, it's manipulation, it's all these things are. It's very well, it is very Shakespearean tragedy, uh, um, and it's epic in its scope. Um, so I think. All of those things, just like as a storyteller, there's just like there's a lot more meat in there as opposed to 
um, fun space adventures of like scoundrels and you know pirates and stuff like that. I mean, you're absolutely right in that there's also so much time to work with uh, mm -hmm. compared to the other two trilogies, which last uh, one to five years. This one spans like 15. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a good point as well. I would uh, also say that I love the Clone Wars series. The Clone Wars series is probably my favorite thing in Star Wars, so it's probably compounded by that. Sure. Uh, you mentioned you love X-Wings. Do you, do you also love X-Wing pilots? Um... I love their jumpsuits, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. and I was a big fan of the um, uh, of the uh, of the Rogue Squadron books um, that came out in the like the mid late nineties. Um, so I I don't know what's happening with the the actual Rogue Squadron movie, but I am all for it. Same. I was at my my favorite C or D list Star Wars character is Big Starfighter. So anytime oh, okay. I hear someone uh, awesome. mention X, you can always like, cosplay. Yeah. With a, a little fake mustache to be big. <laughs> I've, I've done that before. It took me like eight weeks to grow a real one. Uh, <laughs> but it, I, I did do it. It was hard, but I got it done. So uh, what was your reaction to finding out that you would get to write your your dream prequel era Star Wars story? Hmm, I think my, my first reaction was, how am I going to do this? <laughs> because I was already on deadline with, um, with a HarperCollins book. Um, and we're homeschooling right now because of a family immune condition, which it totally sucks. It's like the worst thing in the world. And I have a day job. So it was like thinking about how, how are we going to logistically balance these things? Because um, Star Wars books have a ridiculously short turnaround time. Hmm. Um, and you basically like you're, you're either in or you're out. It's like they don't have time to really kind of um, negotiate that. Um, and I wanted to do it. And my wife, it, who's also a really big fan, like she's she just like, just go do it. We'll, we'll try to figure out how to make it work. Um, so once we got out of that, it was just really, it was just like sheer excitement and disbelief. Um, I would say <laughs> there were moments where I just kind of be thinking about it, like during the synopsis period, and I just kind of like fist pump to myself. Um, and, and I don't want to sound cocky, but I feel like I felt like I could really rock it. You know, I, I feel like I know these characters in my bones and I've always been on the like defend Anakin Skywalker bandwagon. So I thought like, I, I know what to say. Like there's something I want to say. I know how to say it and I know how to accurately translate their voices um, into prose format. So uh, there was really a chance to throw down on that. I, I think you totally succeeded on that. That was one of the first notes I wrote down was just that, yeah, this feels like Obi-Wan and Anakin. Like I thought you nailed their voices in that. So Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you did crush it. I, I feel you. like that this was one of my favorite Clone er, Clone Wars era stories. So uh, I think your love for the Clone Wars translated over. Yeah, the I, I, the idea when when I was outlining it, uh, like I basically thought to myself, this is my chance to write a Clone Wars arc. So make it good. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's exactly you know I I had this question for near the end, but uh, since we're talking about it. I, I kind of thought up my own potential um, Clone Wars little themes for the start of the episodes. Mm. Uh, what would you have written maybe as your your theme oh, the, to open up this book? The little, the little blue text, yeah. Ooh, that's tough. Um, you know, it, it's I'm, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have the quote off the top of my head. Um, I would I would either go with um, and I don't want to spoil it, so I will either go with the very last line of the book, which is my favorite line of the book and one of the, my favorite things that I've written, um, because it's about Anakin and Obi Wan and why they are um, the one of the main themes of the book is that like they belong together and and the reason why the galaxy falls apart is because Palpatine recognizes this and forces them apart as much as he can. Um, so I would go with either that line at the very end of the book. You can actually, for people who have not finished the book yet, you can turn to the very end, like cover the rest with your <laughs> hand. You could read that line and it's not, it's like an emotional spoiler, but it's not <laughs> a plot spoiler. So it, I would either go with that or the thing that Dex says about, it's like uh, facts without context are useless because I, I totally that's totally true. Like these facts can be manipulated or taken out of context and distorted. 
that that makes me feel great because that's what I wrote down as my oh awesome my theme. I'm like, yes, I did it. Uh, yeah, I I Maybe loved your scenes. Hire us. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your scenes with Dexter Jetster, uh, and you you did a great job of this overall, where you pulled in a bunch of existing stuff. You made a ton of references to other content, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just for the sake of it. Like, ah, we got to have Dexter Jetster in there. It's like, we learned more about his relationship. And yeah, I felt like he was stating one of the major themes of the book. Um, it's not really a question, just like a great job with that. I thought oh, you had a you. really, really good balance of bringing in Star Wars stuff, um, it's, but um, giving us new context. When drafting it, um, because like my brain was just kind of like, oh, this would be cool if, if, if we did this here. Um, and, and it was really just like throw all the possible ideas at the kitchen sink, you know, to, to see if if uh, what will pass. And I'd say about like 75 percent of them got through. Um, but they had to be logical, too. It's like, you know, it, it couldn't be like you know, they're on Cato Nemoidia and Dexter Jester just like walks by, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's not quite like that. Like everything, I wanted to make sure everything had proper context to it. Uh, so you on Twitter kind of made a thread about how you put in over 75 little connections, references to other Star Wars material, mm -hmm. mostly books and comics and stuff. And one of the things I do on my channel is try to find all that stuff within mm -hmm. books. And so you stating a number, I was like, oh boy, here we go. Like, this is a challenge. <laughs> uh, I only found like 60. Um, <laughs> so I, I will say that like some of those are like personal Easter eggs for myself. Mm. So like there is a, um, there's actually a Doctor Who reference buried in there. Um, and like, I would count that in their, in their list too. Uh, I gotcha. am actually someone, someone found it and they're like, I can't believe they let you pull this through. I'm like, I know I can't. It's so obvious too. <laughs> well, so there's like, there's a Final Fantasy Easter egg in there. There's a Doctor Who Easter egg in there. So, I, but I, yeah, I have a big spreadsheet and I figured um, maybe like six or eight weeks after the book's release, like I'll just do a mega thread on Twitter and just like go through all of them. But so if you hit about 60, that's probably all of like the Star Wars related ones. <laughs> and then like the remaining 10 or so are probably like the like Easter eggs for other things. Okay, well, that, I, I feel slightly better now. I was like, <laughs> oh man, I, I know I missed some that you talked about, um, but that that is fun that you snuck in other fandoms and stuff. Because yeah, I, I don't really know much about Doctor Who, but I look forward to your thread of uh, <laughs> seeing what else you snuck in there. Do you have a favorite Star Wars reference that that you got in there? I. Uh... I was very pleasantly surprised. So when I wrote my From a Certain Point of View story, um, Disturbance, so that's on the Empire Strikes Back anthology. And that's uh, it's the story of how Palpatine discovers the identity of Luke Skywalker. Um, and it's very steeped in like Clone Wars ties, but I also tie it into the Revenge of the Sith novelization by Matthew Stover, which is like one of the greatest books ever written. Um, and so with this, I felt like there's a real opportunity to to like make a lot of connective tissue with that book. Um, so there are there are three things that like I consciously did with that book. Um, and so this is like minor spoiler territory. I don't think it's I don't think it's really bad. Um, but so the sun dragon metaphor from Revenge of the Sith. Um, I wanted to put that front and center because that's one of my favorite things about that novel is how it like it shows this this myth of this like this this flaming beast and it's how Anakin sees himself but then like the idea that that like a fire beast could become dead and frozen and like decaying in the middle of space like that's Anakin right there those are like the two extremes so that the idea of actually being able to bring that in and show Shmi like telling him that like as like a bedtime story and how he internalizes it into how to view himself. That was really, really important for me. Um, another Revenge of the Sith uh, connection is there's a, it's just a throwaway line when they're actually talking about that myth, but I actually got to create the very short scene um, between Anakin and Obi-Wan where they talk about like the, the dead ice dragon part of it. Um, and that was, just that was a little bit of like a a little easter egg for myself because just to show like i want more people to read revenge of the sith i want to like point them over there 
so it was really cool to actually like take this take this throwaway line um from, from that book and then like put it into here and like ground it into a visual scene um and then like just the syntax that's used in matthew stover's book about like this is anakin skywalker this is obi-wan kenobi this is count dooku i wanted to adapt that into anakin's inner monologue to basically treat the revenge of the sith novel as like his diary <laughs> basically mm -hmm. so um i any ties that I could do to to that book because that book is a really important piece of Star Wars for me, and I feel cool. like that book gets Anakin more than any other piece of media that I've seen. Like everything else is like, um, you know, we see flashes of it, but that one is like so into his head that I, I really wanted to tie into it. Yeah, I, I remember reading that in two thousand five and being mm -hmm. blown away. I was a senior in high school at that point, just eating it up it's it's unlike any other you know star wars book out there and i pitch it to people who like may casually like star wars but there are other types of readers like if they're really into like contemporary fiction or literary fiction and i suggest to them i said like read this book because it's very much like a literary fiction take on on star wars like the, the quality of the prose and the way that the prose plays around with perspective and um uh like tone and like it inserts these little things in there it's like it's not your standard science fiction book so i i i toss it at everyone i can and for like all sorts of reasons well on the opposite end of the clone wars you're, you're kind of getting to to bookend things here mm -hmm. where, where revenge of the sith is right at the end and brotherhood is kind of right at the beginning and we don't know much about those early days so what were you most excited to dig into uh, to help establish what the Clone Wars looked like right at the beginning? Um, so there's two things, really. So there's the, on a personal level, the transition between, for, for Anakin and Obi-Wan, between being like the bickering master and apprentice to the buddies that you see in the Clone Wars movie, there has to be a bridge there. Um, and it it doesn't take a lot of time, like physically within the universe. It's not like a lot of time has passed. So the question is, how did they pivot so quickly um like i know the, the the technical like time is undefined but i treated it in my head as like between attack of the clones and the clone wars movie it's probably like four to six months or so um i like they everyone always said like just it's not defined because i know they want to insert other stories in there but like i had to like treat it in my head that way um with queen's hope kind of like taking place like right in the very beginning of that um so I had my own internal take on like how they did this transition based on the performances in the film. Um, and so we have these two people who the idea is like the context of how you view someone can shift based on your relationships, like, or, or like, you know, their surrounding relationships. So like, let's say someone you have as a coworker that you just can't stand working with, but it turns out that like when you go out and play softball with them, they're really awesome. So it's kind of like that where I imagine these, these things, these feelings that Obi-Wan and Anakin have for each other, they're already there, but because they're they're constantly being shoved into Master and Apprentice, and Obi-Wan's always thinking like, oh, actually, you know, I have to correct him. I can't, you know, I can't see him for the person that he is. And then Anakin's like, oh, he's correcting me again. Why is that? If you remove that mold, um, and then these two people can start working with each other and, and seeing that like, wait a minute, I know that about you. And I actually really like that about you. I, to be able to, to capture that point where like those restrictions get taken away, that was really, really fascinating. Um, and, and I feel like as a writer, um, doing character work is probably my strong suit. So to be able to get in their heads and capture that was really, was really fun and exciting. Um, the other thing that like, I'd always wondered why the Jedi just kind of went with everything at the beginning of the Clone Wars. Because I always thought it was really weird that they're like, okay, here's here's this clone army, and now we're past Geonosis, so the immediate crisis is like kind of done, and now we're into politics and stuff. And so it's like, um, if that's happening, but you, there's still a point of like the Jedi didn't stop and wonder like, why? Why is this happening? So that's the one of the big things that I wanted to capture is why isn't anyone saying that? Or if they are saying that, like, what's the answer? And the answer is, of course, Palpatine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Palpatine is like literally tearing the Jedi apart by throwing so much chaos at them so fast and exploiting their loyalty to the Republic that they just run with it. 
so I wanted to really show that transition between keepers of the peace to soldiers and make that a really important thematic part of the book and have it seen through these different perspectives of like, this is how Anakin views it. This is how Obi-Wan views it. And these are how the, the other original characters view it. So you can kind of get a sense that like, if it was truth, and this is again, going back to the theme about context or facts without context, if it was truth that this was a worthy fight, then everyone would see it the same way. But because everyone's viewing it differently and has a different internalized take on it, that's where you start to see the cracks that like, wait, the Jedi have already lost because Palpatine is just messing with them. Yeah, you touched on two great things that I, I wanted to ask you about. We'll, we'll start with, uh, you mentioned Queen's Hope mm -hmm. right at the very start of the Clone Wars. And so E.K. Johnston also greatly contributes to this early time for the for that era uh, what was the process like working with her to connect both of your stories so well and so strongly uh, i love her books in particular queen's shadow um i love what she did with padme i love the handmaidens i love how she took these little details from the prequels and wove them into instrumental parts of these characters down to like their wardrobe and and their hair so when i got the project i messaged her right away and i told her this is an Anakin and Obi-Wan story, but it's going to take place pretty much right after Queen's Hope. And I wanted to pick her brain on all things Padme because she's Padme's keeper, you know? So, so it's like, I, I told her like, I don't want to get this wrong. Like everything I feel about Padme, I take from her books. Um, so when I finished my outline, I sent her a list of scenes that Padme was in. And first I asked her like, what wardrobe or bodyguard or handmaiden, like that, those sorts of details, like what would Padme have? Because like, like in terms of clothes, like I never pay attention to clothes about anything. <laughs> so it was really helpful to have, to have Kate say like, you know, she would have a hood here or her hair would be up here or her hair would be down here. There's actually a moment in Brotherhood when uh, Padme's hair is down. And that is specifically noted. It's because Kate said, um, based on where she is and what she's doing, this her hair is actually going to be down because that's going to be how she shifts into this like mode of thinking for that. Um, so there was a lot of it was details like that where I would just send emails of like situations and get her take on it. Um, we did create. Um, I have a spreadsheet where like I, I had the outline of Queen's Hope um, and I had the early PDF of it and I kind of broke down like the moments in her book and then the moments that I wanted in mind and made sure that nothing like stomped on each other mm -hmm. and like everything kind of fit together. Um, and then when I had a draft, I sent Padme scenes to Kate and I just asked like, did I get the voice right? Like, even though we're seeing it from Anakin's perspective, does it seem like Padme's voice and her thought process and her actions? Um, so I just really wanted to make sure that I got it right because I really love and respect what she did with Padme. And I also Easter egged some of her original characters into my book. Some of it's logistics and some of it's just fun. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. The two books uh, work really well as a duology. It's fun that they came out so close together that you can read them e even in like chronological order, but uh, that they, they were a blast to have side by side. Yeah. Um, and I would say like, so if for people who, who read it or who read both of them, so read Queen's Hope and then read Brotherhood and then read the very end of Queen's Hope again. Hmm. I will do that after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So uh, you also mentioned just Palpatine manipulating everything. I, yeah. I love as he does. <laughs> yeah, like he does. He can't help himself. <laughs> I, I really liked what you said about knights or Padawans being pushed into knighthood too mm -hmm. quickly. That harkened back to Padawans like Nadar Veb. That's what I immediately jumped to of, yeah, this guy's not ready to be a Jedi. He's not ready to lead clone troopers. But like right in the opening crawl, you see the Jedi are having to shift the way that they operate. And it's kind of at Palpatine's behest where he's like, yeah, we got to get Pat, uh, Padawans onto the front lines because who knows how long this war is going to last. Mm -hmm. And seeing how the Padawans and younglings react to that, uh, which leads us to uh, Mill, who was mm -hmm. a really fun character a padawan who is like one of the only jedi characters who is like what's going on here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like developing uh mill and how did you go about making sure that anakin's experiences with her weren't too much like what he's about to go through with ahsoka 
Yeah. So when 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 I was crafting Mill, um, so she was in the original pitch um, that that I sent to to Lucasfilm, and the idea was to give Obi Wan needed a foil and uh, Anakin needed a foil, and Anakin's foil could not feel anything like Ahsoka. So we did talk through it, and the idea was more to to not even like to be completely different from Ahsoka, but have her be like a precursor, something that shows the people around Anakin that he's ready for this and it's going to be good for him, even though he doesn't think that he actually wants it. So if you, if you watch attack of the clones and then you read this and then you hit the clone wars movie, it should feel like a very natural progression. So the main thing was we don't want, I didn't want um, people to be like, you know, if they go to the Clone Wars movie and they'll be like, why are they just giving him a Padawan? Like, I wanted it to be like, oh, I have an answer for you. And it makes sense. Um, as a character, so I mentioned that I wanted her to be like a foil for Anakin. Uh, Anakin is like all feelings and like his challenge is like constantly trying to suppress that. So he's got his guard up and he's showing, you know, this much to Obi-Wan and this much to Padme and this much to Palpatine. Um, but he's got like this storm inside of him. So I wanted someone that Anakin couldn't hide from um, emotionally, which is where Mill Mill has this unique empathic ability and, and she detects suffering. So that, that opens up the door to two things with the war. Um, it's what is actually happening with the war because the galaxy is suffering and she feels it differently. So she's not quite as gun ho about like, I want to get my Kyber crystal and I want to join the Jedi and like, let's go. You know, she thinks and feels it differently. But then with Anakin, when she's with Anakin, um, she, every time he feels something about his mom or Padme or this is right, or this is wrong, like she senses that. So it's this unique ability to open the door to say like, no, Anakin, you can't hide from me. I see all of you. And for them to build a relationship around that, she sees the dragon inside him. And even still, she really cares about him. So I think it's the first time that I can think of in Star Wars, except for maybe like in the Mortis trilogy in Clone Wars, where someone can see Anakin unfiltered. Um, and I thought that was really cool to ground that in someone who still has her innocence somewhat like she's growing up she's about 12 years old um in the book so but she hasn't been jaded by galactic politics or war or anything like that and she hasn't been so institutionalized by like being in the jedi order that she's got her eyes open mm -hmm. yeah I, I liked how you showed as the jedi shift into being warriors how it even affects the younglings and how they're all so excited to get their lightsabers and they're already playing war basically yeah. instead of, you know, playing peacekeeper and what they should be doing. So uh, mill was a really cool character. Do you think that she stayed on that course or in your head canon? Did, did she ever go to get that lightsaber or um, what, what do you think happened to her? I think from a very practical perspective. And so I, I'll, I will dance around <laughs> spoilers. Um, her fate in, in this book and the the people that she winds up with i would think that she does from a practical defense perspective like would get a lightsaber just because it's probably needed for for the things that she's going to be doing but i think she's always going to view like a lot of the jedi and anakin even talks about it in this book they view their lightsaber as an extension of their body and, and it is for them because it's just like this flow thing for them and, and mill probably views it just like a blaster you know, it is a tool for, for defense um, or cutting through stuff <laughs> as needed. <laughs> um, so I hope she survives Order 66. I, I have, like, if someone wants to pick her up later, um, her buddy in the story is uh, the character named Vivert is actually named after one of my, my daughter's friends. And so, like, I was talking with the, the parents and I'm like, I hope you know someone picks this up later, <laughs> so we know. Like, if just Easter egg them somewhere in there, they're like <laughs> smugglers in the original trilogy era, just to know that they made it. I think yeah. <laughs> that's the hard part of writing all these youngling characters. It's like <laughs> you keep thinking, like, oh, which, which, who's gonna get you? <laughs> yeah, we we need to get a story where you know Mill and Viver and Katuni and Gungi, mm -hmm. like they're all on a ship somewhere. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah, they're all they're all, they all made it. They're fine. <laughs> All the younglings got out. 
Uh, speaking of new characters, I wanted to talk about uh, Rug as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she was really, really interesting. What What do you think was the biggest challenge writing a character like that who came off as likable, but by her own admission, uh, has done some pretty terrible things in the service of uh, the Nemoidian people? So when I pitched Rug originally, she like it came kind of fully formed. And I told my editor um, that I was thinking uh, Major Kira from Deep Space Nine meets Garrus Vakarian from Mass Effect. So Kira in Deep Space Nine is like this Bajoran resistance person who becomes part of the Federation and works on Deep Space Nine. So she's always, she's always loyal to her people, but she's wary of the Federation, like supposedly like helping their people. Um, and then Garrus in Mass Effect, Mass Effect One in particular, is like he's tired of like the CSEC politics always kind of getting in the way of him doing his job. So these characters, they have this common value, and that's a dedication to what they believe is right, regardless of like shifting politics and governments around there. So Rug is very, very self-aware of this. She knows that she's a tool of the government. Um, she. She's done her job, and and she knows that like so she's a special forces uh, officer for or former special forces for for the Nemoidian army. So she acknowledges that she's basically done the will of of the army, even when she knows like this person is kind of innocent or this person is kind of guilty. She sees that spectrum, and I thought it was important to present that because the um, the Jedi are just kind of like charging in blindly, like we're doing good, you know, we're for the Republic. Um, and so it was good to have like another perspective from someone who's been through so much war that she's like, oh, there's no right or wrong about this. It's just politics. Um, and so she looks at it as regardless of how it's framed politically, she knows like, does this advance safety for the Nemoidian people? And that's like kind of her guiding light in there. She's really good foil for Obi-Wan because she's very open about this. Like, you know, she tells Obi-Wan like, you know, your war is, you know, it's a war and wars happen and they're not always great. Um, and she will admit that she doesn't necessarily care for the Trade Federation leadership, but she recognizes that as an entity, they do help her people. So it's interesting having Obi-Wan who's all about like faith in his institutions and then Rug who is like institutions change, but people don't. Um, so to have them work together and have these conversations with each other was really, really juicy. I, yeah, I love everything that you did with Rug and the Nemoidians. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to watch uh, The Phantom Menace, especially the same way, looking at the the, the Nemoidian people where you, you kind of took that line from Qui-Gon where he's like, ah, they're all cowards. And... Yeah, actually, I, I you know, I love Qui-Gon Jinn. He's probably my, my favorite. Like, he's who a Jedi should be. But I'm like, yeah, that was... Mm -hmm. That was pretty racist, quite gone. <laughs> and you, you've kind of opened it up to where no, this is the Nemoidian people are a whole people, and they're not yeah. all just the Trade Federation. And I, I again, this is kind of the the idea that you could have just done a story that was like, oh, it's that wacky business on Cato Nemoidia, but you're mm -hmm. like, no, no, <laughs> you, you made it something really meaty, uh, and ha and it had meaning or meaning, and uh, the, I, I um... really, really appreciate that. With the Nemoidians, one of the things when they first presented to me, like, you know, we want to do like that business on Cato Nemoidia, but we'd like to actually dive into their culture a little bit. And I'm like, oh, that's really, really interesting because like I have actually thought that about about that line in The Phantom Menace. Um, and and so I wanted to show like I talked with my editor, who's also a big Star Trek fan. <laughs> so we talked about what Deep Space Nine did for the Ferengi um and showing how like the different elements of their culture which which um kind of show like the where the stereotypes come from like why people outside would, would see that um but then also show like how their own people like react to that so that was really the big inspiration for this was like we wanted to to like give it depth but then if you only saw the surface level you could extrapolate the stereotype of oh they're cowards and they only care about money right and again it's kind of that the dexter jester line of you know that there's no context to, mm -hmm. to what you're saying yeah you, you're just going off of your beliefs because uh qui-gon said it once or 
you, you're basing everything about the people based on the the trade federation mm -hmm. and what they do and yeah i like the way you say that uh that you know the trade federation isn't the best but they do help the nemoidian people and so it's more complex than uh i guess you you initially think that it would be in the phantom menace yeah which is kind of the just the good thing about Star Wars books is you get mm -hmm. to really dive into all those complexities where uh, the movies tend to tell the more black and white stories and then the books are where things get more complicated. And I like that. I think that's why I personally love the Clone Wars series so much because there's so many different elements like you know, with the, the with the clone battalions, with like the minor Jedi, with like the smugglers of the era. It's like it really, really rounds them out. Um, and it gives it this space to breathe that like, because just jumping from attack of the clones to revenge of the Sith is kind of jarring because there's like so much that happens. And I, I get why from, from like, if we're going to outline the journey of Anakin Skywalker, it's like, okay, this is point a inflection point a inflection point B inflection point C, but then the between B and C has so much that is important to just the universe there that um, that's why I love the clone wars so much. The, the Revenge of the Sith Crawl has that line, like there are heroes and villains on both sides mm -hmm. and evil is everywhere. It's like, yeah, that line's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Where the, <laughs> yeah. the, the movie doesn't have the time to explore that, but the Clone Wars does and the books mm -hmm. do. Uh, and I love getting to dive into that universe more. Um, so I'm just about out of questions. I do want to ask, without spoilers, uh, mm -hmm. in your opinion, does that business on Cato Nemoidi account? I'd say, of course it does, because <laughs> so without spoilers, um, uh, even though Obi-Wan had a plan, plans go sideways. So, you know, if Anakin crashes into it and gets you through it, then it counts. So, OK, we'll put another tick 10 times. Yeah, Obi -Wan, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, about Brotherhood? Um, I just hope fans like it. <laughs> I, I it's. Like I said, it's everything that I wanted a Clone Wars arc to be, but I also wanted to really get into the heads of Obi Wan and Anakin, and like kind of and really like ground them in the reality of the moment. So we see, we experience not just their adventures, but who they are as people as they kind of shift into becoming better people um, and have a better relationship with each other. So. Um, outside of like the space adventure aspect of it i i hope this really helps people connect to to both of them but especially anakin because i think sometimes anakin gets a bad rap and it's like anakin anakin yeah he ultimately makes the choice to turn to the dark side but he has not like all of the systemic su support that someone should have when when they experience trauma at the ages that he has experienced trauma like he has none of that there he has forces actively working against him um and so i really wanted um to make him a sympathetic character that as my um my editor put it he's likable but very eye rolly and i wanted <laughs> I, I really wanted people to feel that that like yeah, as emo as he gets or as ridiculous as he gets, like we still love him because he is a good person struggling to do right when forces outside of him are really pulling at him to to pull to veer him into the wrong path. Well, I again I'll just say I think that you nailed it. This felt like it could have very easily been an arc of the Clone Wars. It feels like it bookends things in so many ways. Uh I got that that excerpt with Asajj was already out there. So mm -hmm. like having Asajj in it was so much fun. And yeah, getting to see that shift between Obi-Wan and Anakin's dynamic. Uh, I, I think you crushed it. So I, I think anyone that likes the prequels, anyone that likes the Clone Wars is going to be really happy with this. Oh, I'll, I'll just point out that I, I fought to give Obi-Wan the mega mullet. In the, in, the, in the book because there was discussion of like would his hair have already been cut at this point and i'm like please just let me use the mullet i have some cool things in place for the mullet if you just give it to me so i was yeah. very happy that they give me the mullet yeah i think that's fun and important to see them shifting and kind of poking fun at each other with their mm -hmm. hair and how it's changing uh getting to look at their armor for the first time all those little moments just again it helps that kind of transition from attack of the clones into the clone wars yeah you yeah, know i think the and someone 
I was talking with someone, they're like, do you think people will get the, um, like the real world parables that you're throwing in here? I'm like, I don't know, because I tried to not make it obvious because like, you know, we live in very complex times on all sorts of levels. Um, but you know, if, if, if people feel a little bit like if it opens the door for them thinking about like the way that information is treated or the way that governments work or things like that, then like, you know, mission accomplished part two. I think so. <laughs> there were, there were definitely some things that, that I wrote down. Uh, we can talk about them if you want, but if that's like getting to spoiler territory. Um, uh, it's up to you. And cause I, I, uh, I don't know how spoilery your audience typically prefers. <laughs> well, I'll put a, a warning up, but uh, this will probably come out a couple days after the book, so people okay. can have a, a chance to read it. When we talk about other, when we other, you know, as a verb, other mm -hmm. cultures, um, it's the idea is that like you you take apart like usually like the very best and the very worst, and you just kind of lump it together, and then when when things go bad, like you like the best becomes the worst. Like you, it's very much like highlighted and exploited. And with the Nemoidians, I thought it was really important. There's a big passage in there about like their arts. Um, yep. And I really wanted to get into that because like in Star Wars, like that's never really been discussed before, but also as when we get to appreciate other cultures, it's often through their arts. It's often through like their music or like their video games that they've made or like their film, especially their film, really, um, their comics, things like that. And, and you know, that's why I think like diverse creators in, in books and film and everything, they, they're allowed to like trickle in that like that those influences and then present it in a new way for a new audience and that helps build these bridges between cultures um and so i really wanted to emphasize that point of i mean like you could take it like from like a really top level point of view of like <laughs> don't stereotype people they're actually people <laughs> but um going a little more granular than that i i think like because information is consumed so quickly and passed around so fast and like, and everyone reacts instantly to things right now. Um, I wanted to put show like in the, the point of, in the context of Star Wars, like even Anakin's kind of like, or is, especially Obi-Wan goes through this in the middle of brotherhood when he's like, like knee deep in like the Nemoidians. And I wanted Obi-Wan to have like a moment of like, oh, I did do that. Like I did stereotype you know, and like the weight of that and like a little bit of like internalized shame because it's okay to feel that and have that epiphany as long as you move forward with it. Um, and so that was that was one of the like real world parables <laughs> that I wove into this book. Yeah, I, and it was that section about their art and uh, the, the, the family that went to Coruscant and was treated terribly. Uh, that that was what struck with me. And just thinking about how much Star Wars has been influenced by Japanese film mm -hmm. and samurai films. And like it, it it's always been there. And I, I think people forget that, that, you know, so much of this universe that they love uh, is influenced by uh, Asian culture and Asian art. Yeah. It's, you know, George Lucas loves his Kurosawa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me this morning. Um, where can people follow you online and what other non-Star Wars stories have you written that you think Star Wars fans would enjoy? I am mostly on Twitter at Mike Chen Writer. It's very important to put writer <clears throat> on there because there's a YouTube chef who is way more popular <laughs> than me. Uh, so you don't want to get us confused as some people have in the past. Um, I have a website that I don't update enough at MikeChanBooks.com. I'm on Instagram at Mike Chen Writer, but it's mostly just like pictures of my dog. So it's, it's not that exciting. Um, I would say that um, if you're going to pick up uh, one of my books, um, the one that, that I recommend for you depends on your favorite subgenre of sci-fi. So um, if you like Doctor Who and time travel stories, there's Here and Now and Then, which is my uh, debut. If you like dystopian, there is A Beginning at the End, which is my post-pandemic book that came out right when the pandemic hit. So that totally sucked. Um, <laughs> but, people, but people seem to be coming around to it because it's a very hopeful reconstruction book. Um, if you like superheroes and Marvel and DC, especially Jessica Jones or Legends of Tomorrow, uh, We Could Be Heroes is my superhero 
best friends book. Um, and if you like the X Files, um, Light Years from Home just came out um, a few months ago. And I, that's like my X Files, except it's about the family in the episode, not Mulder and Scully. Um, so I've heard that despite the fact that I, I constantly bounce between genres, people find very consistent character work in my books. And I think that trickles into Brotherhood. Um, I, someone else told me that Brotherhood is a very Mike Chen book. It's just Star Wars. So I hope that if you enjoyed Brotherhood, I think uh, you'll you like my other work. Great. Awesome. I'll put, I'll put links to everything down in the description. Uh, thank you again for taking some time to talk with us. And thank you all for watching or listening. And may the force be with you.